Hello friends and welcome back to the Great Books of China series. Uh, today I thought I'd do something different. I'm not going to talk about a book or a work today. Uh, I'm just do, going to do a little thematic special and I'm going to talk about why I study classical languages. Mm, uh, it's not going to be my personal story, but this is going to be my approach. It's not really a how-to, it's not my recommendations or anything, but I hope that it might serve as, as inspiration for any aspiring classicists out there. And I'll just get right to it. And I'll, I'm going to talk a lot about hermeneutics to begin with, which is sort of my way to get into uh, describing more systematically what this is about. So hermeneutics is the branch of philosophy that deals with understanding. That's called hermeneutics. And in Chinese, it's called jie shi xue, which I think is a really sweet word, explainology, right? And this is a philosophy of understanding that evolves from classical philology, that is the reasoned understanding of texts in classical languages, in the 19th century, primarily in Germany. And within hermeneutics, you can say that the understanding of text functions as the basic model for understanding in general. So it's not just about text, but it starts with texts. Um, that's the historical root, and you can say that understanding in general within hermeneutics is sort of conceptualized by means of the metaphor of understanding texts. And the char characteristic thing about hermeneutics is that it posits a special relation between subject and object, the one who understands, and the thing or the text uh, that is understood. And uh, um, I just said right now that hermeneutics developed in the 19th century, and it did as a, as a systematic discipline, but hermeneutic principles had been enunciated much earlier than that. And I'm going to give you examples of, of, of how, how these principles, how they turn up in various points in history. And one notable example of this, which I thought I'd start with, is a motto that comes from the Protestant theologian Bengel, who lived in the early 18th century in Germany. And this motto is in Latin, and it says, Te totum applica ad textum, rem totam ad te. And that means, apply all of yourself to the text, and all of its subject matter to yourself. So this is a, a principle of explication of texts. And you hear, just from this quote, you can say that hermeneutics is a philosophy that recognizes, to begin with, it recognizes that all reading is the reading of a certain reader. Um, the reading happens inside of your soul. It's a process that goes on inside of you. So your reading is always going to be your reading, and it cannot but be your reading. And this means that a text cannot really, in the strictest sense, ever be said to have an objective meaning, a meaning that's independent of the mind who reads. That's the most basic thing to know about hermeneutics. But it goes further than that, because the point isn't that a text doesn't have a true meaning. I mean, it's pretty easy to accept in a general sort of way that no reading is objective. What hermeneutics says is something much more transformative than that. The point is to use this insight to arrive at a much more comprehensive view of the true meaning of what you're reading. So let's go back to the formula, which was te totum applica textum, apply all of yourself to the text, rem totam ad te, and all of its subjects matters to yourself. And so you can see that there's a two-way relation that's posited between the reader and the text. Uh, hermeneutics, we can say, has a view of the human being, the human person, as a unified thing. Uh, there's this uh, sense that there's nothing about you, whatever it is about you, that you can't apply uh, when you construct your understanding of a certain text. Te totum applica textum. Apply all of yourself to the text. Uh, that is, you shouldn't make in a, a priori assum assumptions about what in your intellect or in your experience that is relevant or not to understand the text. You should sort of be maximally open-minded about that. And also, even more interesting perhaps, the text should be applied to you. Which may sound strange because we read a text to understand the text, right? Well, it's not that simple. In a sense, we should try to read every text as if it was about you. And that may sound slightly bizarre, and I will try to explain what I mean by that and what hermeneutics mean, means by that. And I hope that it will become clear in a minute. Uh, and there's a classic image for how this works um, in the so-called hermeneutic circle, which is a concept that uh, you may have heard about. 
It's the image of understanding uh, moving in circles from the subject towards the object and then back again, round and round and round like this. And uh, the classic description of this comes from Hans Georg Gadamer, who was a German 20th century philosopher, and he was a student of Heidegger. And his model is intended to uh, describe understanding in general, but the example he uses is, interestingly enough, learning to understand an ancient language, like Latin. So, uh, learning an ancient language is ob obviously a formidable hermeneutic challenge and, and challenge for, for your understanding. Because, I mean, say that you want to learn to read Homer in the original. The original cultural context for this poem is, is lost. It's been lost for thousands of years. There is no living person that we can approach to give us any sort of first-hand information on what the words of the text mean. And the situation we are in, essentially, is just the text and your own mind. And that's where the hermeneutic circle starts. And Gadamer, he tells us that uh, there's no way for us to get outside of ourselves to achieve understanding. So it's inevitable that we start out by projecting our preconceptions on the text. Which, which sounds uh, stupid and wrong, but it's not. So let's take an example so that it becomes clear. Um, there are, when you start learning a language, various rote translations of words in a foreign language. I mean, uh, let's take as an example the word "ai" in Chinese. Uh, if you're a beginner, uh, you will simply learn that "ai" means uh, to love as a verb or love as a noun. And, and that, thus you will, you will project the English language concept of love, your concept, on the Chinese word. That's sort of the first step of understanding. Uh, now, it so happens that the word ai in classical Chinese is quite different from the English word love. Uh, and w when you start noticing this, that can be said to constitute step two in the hermeneutic circle. Because if you read much in classical Chinese, it may occur to you that the word ai is often used in a vaguely negative way. That's quite foreign to uh, the more uh, purely positive sense that the word love has in English. Um, and I in Chinese usually has undertones like having undue affection for something, uh, be jealous over something, being possessive about something, or liking something to the point of clouding one's judgment. And this means, when you start noticing things like this, that means that the text uh, or the language that you're learning is sort of it's starting to speak back. Uh, it's starting to send back information to you. So your preconceptions, which you started out with, and which were necessary for a preliminary understanding, they become renewed, refined, updated, through sympathetic contact, contact with the text. Uh, and then the, the hermeneutic circles keeps on spinning, because the, the point is, you st have to remember, you still get no unmediated information from the text. Uh, the, the basic situation of you, you here in the text there, and that's all there is, that doesn't really change. But what changes is that your, the, the preconceptions that you keep on projecting on the text uh, become vastly different. They can become much more adequate for the task at hand the more this hermeneutic circle keeps on spinning. And Gadamer's way of describing this is that we have our own so-called horizon of understanding. This is Gadamer's term, and that this horizon is sort of expanded and modified until it starts approaching the horizon of the text's author. And achieving this is called a, fusions of, a fusion of horizons by Gadamer. It's in German, I think it's Horizontenverschmelzung, it's a wonderful long word. And he terms this accomplished fusion of horizons the miracle of understanding. Why is it a miracle? It's a miracle because we start out from an explicit understanding that the only thing we really have access to is our own mind. But when understanding is achieved, it's accompanied by a sense that our powers of conception have been enlarged by contact with something external, some other, you know, uh, other with a capital O. And all that I just said may appear to be rather technical, and, and Gadamer's claim was that this 
actually is how all understanding of any text happens. As a matter of fact, he was trying to be sort of factual about this and, and, and describing a theoretical model that could be applied generally. Uh, but I think it isn't a coincidence that his archetypal example has to do with learning a classical languages. And of course, partly that reflects the historical fact that the whole discipline of hermeneutics grew out of philological practice, that it was the experience of actually learning to understand ancient literature that led to a philosophical investigation of understanding in itself. Uh, but I think it's more than that. Because it's that understanding literature in classical Chinese, for example, for me, who is a 21st century person from Sweden, uh, that presents so formidable problems of understanding that such a project is uniquely suited for awakening a, 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 an awareness of the actual process of understanding in itself, and most specifically the miraculous aspect of it. Of it. And perhaps, you know, maybe it doesn't seem to you very miraculous that I sit here and I'm able, however imperfectly, to understand a text that was written 2,000 years ago in China. Well, it's not a miracle, you say. But then I just say, try it for yourself. And you come back to me when you when your supreme effort allows you to actually hear the voice of Confucius, for example. I mean, you will find that this is a miracle. It's akin to uh, resurrection from the dead, because these are voices that sound completely different from anything out of your world of lived, non-literary experience. And they can be made to communicate with you across immense time spans. And this is also why, by the way, that I find almost no value at all in translations of ancient literature. I mean, they are a help in studying, that's all, but they don't convey a, a tenth part of the true understanding of the text. And, and as far as concerns the actual uh, project of understanding in the sense that we're talking about now, I mean, they're simply not the correct material for it. You have to go to the, to the original. Uh, okay, so uh, now I've talked about this hermeneutics for a long time. I hope you have sort of a sense of what it means. Uh, and I'm trying to sort of get back now to why I study uh, classical Chinese. And maybe you can guess part of the answer by this uh, point. I think part of the great utility of studying classical languages, uh, for me at least, is that I find that after like 15 years or whatever it's been that I'm doing this now, uh, this awareness of the miracle of understanding, this conscious awareness of this, it's starting to become like second nature. I know in an experiential way that I am capable of reaching out with my own mind to understand another, and I know that attentive listening or reading to another person uh, has the potential to permanently enrich me. And I know it as a fact, you know. It's not as words. It's something that someone said to me or wants me to believe. Uh, I know it for a fact. And here we reach another point that I haven't mentioned so far, uh, and which also isn't actually a part of Gallimer's system of hermeneutics or anything like that. But the fact is uh, that any type of communication, and reading is a, is a form of communication, it presupposes, actually, uh, even this might sound strange, it presupposes a fundamental identity between the concerned parties, the sender and, and the receiver. Uh, the only way that any text, uh, I mean, let's just talk about texts here for a moment, the only way that any text uh, can make sense to you, ever, is by imagining a speaker who is like you. And I don't mean like a little bit like you, or, or like you in some way, I mean exactly like you. If you cannot imagine yourself thinking the thought, or saying the thing that you read, that means uh, it remains close to you. I mean, it's, it's a dead thing, it doesn't concern you. I mean, it, it may just as well be made unread. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, perhaps I should mention it, actually, there's a whole school uh, of literary criticism that's called phenomenological, and that, that is basically a school of criticism that shares my concerns here. And one such critic, he has a very memorable formulation of the ideal state of reading, which is basically what I said right now, and it goes like this. They are the thoughts of another, yet it is I who am their subject. That is, grammatical subject. I make myself capable to think the thoughts of another. Yeah, okay, so making yourself capable of thinking the thoughts of another. Maybe you think now, it, isn't that quite obvious? I mean, of course you read in order to have access to the thoughts of another. 
Yes, of course. And it's been said in many ways, many times. It's almost a cliche. But I'm going to make the claim now that what people usually mean by that is a form of propositional knowledge. They read a book and afterwards they can tell us that the author thinks X, Y and Z and thus they have gained access to the thoughts of another. Well, that's not what I mean. What I mean is actually thinking the thought, not being, not, not being able to tell you what it is. Let's take uh, two simple examples. We know that Mencius said that human nature is good and that Xunzi said that human nature is evil. Boring old knowledge. It's ancient stuff, you know. Everyone knows it. It is in every basic textbook of Chinese philosophy. And the only way that this can ever become interesting to you is by making yourself think these thoughts. You have to reach inside of yourself, in the world of your intellect and in the world of your experience, and find the things that correspond to those statements. And then, through an act of imagination, to make it present to yourself what it's like to put such a realization at the center of your experiential and intellectual world. I mean, you must try to make yourself really feel what it's like to think that human beings are good, or that they are evil, or anything else that you might be reading, that Jesus died for your sins, or that the Creator has a covenant with the Jewish nation, or any such thing. That is reading. That is really truly to think the thoughts of another. You don't stay away from it, you don't stay on the surface, you go below the surface. And um, um, we have a sort of innate capacity for that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I said it right before that people sort of prefer to stay on the surface of things, um, that this sort of propositional knowledge about texts is usually seen as enough. But despite this, I mean, my view is actually that people manage to think each other's thoughts all the time, also in the deep sense that I, I am, I'm saying right now. Uh, I think, for example, that the incredible ease with which we imbibe all kinds of political and social ideas from media, uh, that's uh, actually an example of how effective and operative this faculty of the human mind is. Um, but it's especially easy to do this with people who are similar to you. I mean, the, when the thoughts they communicate are similar, or they have a similar basis to your own conscious thoughts, then this sympathetic identification with the sender, it's really fast as lightning. Um, but people are actually really bad at thinking the thoughts of people uh, who are different from them, people who are their other, capital O. You know? and, and that's of course natural, because I mean, in a way at least, otherwise they wouldn't be their others. But what I'm going to claim here is that even people who make it their job to read, you know, in a broad sense, to understand cultural phenomena and history and so forth, even those people are usually not very capable of this kind of sympathetic reading that I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of the time, actually, I think people subconsciously have the wrong motivations for learning about, say, China. Uh, very frequently, I feel that uh, um, it's as if Westerners who write about China they have this barely repressed urge to always find themselves as they are now in the other. You know, like we are just the same, reaching this sort of conclusion. And I think this is very different from what I'm saying, which is that you only understand another by constructing or rebuilding your own self in dialogue with the other. Uh, the caricature of what I'm talking about is like the American who goes to China for the first time and he has nothing, no knowledge, he only has his own prejudice. And then after two weeks, he's all like, well, you know, I thought they were all just a bunch of godless commies, but actually, you know, they're people just like us. And it's all just because the old lady in the noodle shop smiled at him or something. And uh, <laughs> I mean, this, this may sound horribly disrespectful, and I guess it is, but I think that a lot of China scholars, China journalists and so on, they're basically just a bit dressed up versions of that. And that includes for me the whole sort of Edward Said uh, anti-orientalist school of thought, you know, that fears nothing so much as exoticism, and they, and they claim that it's either our fear of the others or our secret desire to oppress them that makes us imagine that they're so different from us. And uh, especially nowadays, I think people in the West, uh, especially the educated classes and perhaps these sort of area studies types in particular, they're positively terrified of the idea 
that there may be some essential, you know, non-trivial difference between cultures, because that immediately leads to this thought that, I mean, for example, what if this whole Cold War situation uh, in the relation, I mean, the, the thing that's happening now uh, in, in the relation between China and United States, for example, what if that is more than great power politics or ideology? What if it actually reflects real cultural differences? I mean, that's an unbearable thought. That, that's, we, we cannot think that thought. There's no way to deal with it. I mean, this is the historical moment where we all have to come together to save the planet. You know? I don't know. And it's, it's not just China, it's Islam. <laughs> it's the same thing there. I won't get started on that. It's much safer always to presume that there isn't any real difference between us. You know? And then making that assumption and, and remain willfully ignorant about other people. It's much simpler. Okay, so the point here isn't really my opinion on any of that stuff or anybody else's opinion on that. The point is that when I read, that is, when I take the trouble of learning an ancient language to read an extremely old and foreign text, in every sense of foreign text, I'm not primarily interested in sort of recognizing my uh, quote-unquote common humanity with those ancient people. I mean, I know that Confucius breathed air. I know that he felt pain. I know that he bled, that he defecated, that he made love. I mean, it's really beyond me why anyone would study uh, classical languages if they're not interested in the differences. I mean, if they don't want to come into contact with something that's genuinely, deeply strange. I mean, strange as a, as a stranger is strange. Um, something that makes all of the variety that you've previously known seem like mere versions of the same thing. I mean, what's the point then? And I've already given you the hermeneutic background, so you should understand that what I mean is uh, come into contact with those, these foreign things in a sympathetic way. I mean, you shouldn't just sit there and look, oh, they're so different. Uh, I don't think that's interesting. I mean, I, I want to make myself feel the subjective force of various worldviews, opinions, value judgments. That's what, that, that's what makes it worthwhile. So I'll take another example, and um, it's about Confucius, again. Uh, and this is something that you may not hear said about Confucius every day. Uh, it's somewhat frequent to hear Confucius being described as a Chinese humanist. And we have this uh, Wing Tsit Chan, you know, the guy who wrote the um, source book to Chinese philosophy, remember that? Yeah. So that guy, he even described the entire philosophy of Chinese, uh, the, sorry, the entire history of Chinese philosophy as being the history of Chinese humanism. Uh, and of course, it's not like this word humanism has a very definite meaning, but just think about what I'm going to say now. So when Confucius lived uh, 2,500 years ago, more or less, it was customary when a great ruler died uh, to bury a number of people together with him. And this isn't mentioned very frequently in the literature or philosophy of the era, uh, but it, it pops up here and there, and we know it for a fact from a lot of excavated tombs. Uh, this is something that, I mean, perhaps you don't know this, but it's a funny thing with ancient China, I mean, pre-imperial China, that, you know, the, the actual material evidence that we have from this period, it comes almost entirely from tombs. So it's rich people's tombs ducal tombs, royal tombs. And there we find always, or usually at least, these little pits or whatever with a number of victims inside. So, I mean, this is not something I'm an expert on. It's vaguely <laughs> terrifying, of course, but, but this usage persisted. I mean, occasionally at least until quite late. We find examples of it in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, so certainly in Confucius' time this existed. <coughs> So I'll just ask you a question. Does this sound to you like a humanist culture? I mean, whatever spin we put on that word. And of course, I talk, started talking about Confucius. We don't know exactly what Confucius thought about those things. But, you know, he was certainly not above criticizing power. Uh, and there's a funny bit, actually, in the Analects that I'm thinking of now. Because he, he said... Um, there's, there's a, a quote that I've pulled out here, and he said the following about the Ji clan, which basically were the power in the people in power in his state back then. 
所以这八亿五于庭，是可忍也，孰不可忍也？呃，八亿五于庭 ，that means eight rows of dancers dancing in his yard in his court. If something like this can be tolerated, what cannot be tolerated? This is an interesting text, don't you think? What does this refer to? I mean, eight rows of dancers. This is a ritual dance. It's a it's a, a dance that only um, it, it's number of dan dancers that only the royal court were actually able, uh, allowed to employ according to the rich the ritual system of the Zhou Dynasty. You know, Confucius is basically a type of intellectual conservative. Of course, I mean, he he looks back to the great men of the early Zhou Dynasty. And especially uh, the Li, the civilized form of society that was established back then. And this is, in particular, it's these ritual forms of behavior in context of the royal court and so on. And these dancers, these eight rows of dancers that the Ji clan employed, they infringe on that perfect system that Confucius uh, worshipped, and that's why he is upset. You know, if this can be tolerated, what cannot be tolerated? You know, this is the most intolerable thing imaginable for him. But he must have been aware of the practice of, you know, immolating victims for royal burials. But that's less tolerable to him than the G clan having a few dances too many. Well, you know, perhaps not. I mean, we, the, I'm taking a lot of assumptions and I'm putting it just behind this text. So take it with a grain of salt. But at least it's not like we see him criticizing burying people alive anywhere from a sort of humanist perspective. The point is, these people are different from us. They're different. It's useless to downplay it, I think. And that's what I find interesting. That's what I'm interested in understanding. I don't shy away from these things. Uh, and I think it could be a very useful exercise, actually, to imagine the teachings of Confucius. I mean, as far as you have studied and with as perfect and sympathetic an understanding as you're capable of, and also in the same sympathetic way, to imagine why, why that would lead you to make sort of less of a fuss of, of, of people being buried alive than a bunch of ritual dancers. So I don't want to make... Uh, ancient people. I don't want to meet ancient people in a circumscribed little circle of common humanity. I'm not at all sure that we share enough for that to be very interesting, actually. I mean, I want to know who they really are, especially when they're different from me. Again, I believe in hermeneutics. I have to use myself, you know, and in, in order to understand them, I can't remain the same. And this is a bit terrifying, too. It's because to understand how someone might find moral delight in ritual murder, let's say that Confucius could, I mean, I have to find or invent a part of me who is like that, actually. Hmm? Do you believe that you can't find anything like that in you? Perhaps you can't. I mean, maybe you're not that kind of person. But I always think of Walt Whitman's immortal line. I am vast. I contain multitudes. I mean, you don't have to be a single way. Your soul can be a meeting place for spirits from every time and place. It really comes down to how much of a, of a conjurer you are. It's a kind of wizardry almost. And it has to be egoless because essentially, I mean, you can't make room for other spirits in yourself if you think that you're this little thing, you know, bound in a single spot on the earth. I mean, if you're jealous over this here and now, and you always try to protect that, the things that you gain by renouncing that, you know, they are simply inestimable. I mean, there's nothing that can be compared to feeling yourself in the company of people like Confucius, for example. I mean, these are people who, with their thoughts, gave birth to this world. And it's also actually, it's when you do that, that you really can become yourself as well. Because it's really only when you've digested them that you can go beyond them. Because you don't know how much of yourself, or what you call yourself, that's just inheritance. Cultural, you know, sedimentation. Not until you've raised your gaze to really meet the people who gave you that inheritance. I mean, you know, it's funny because every sociology professor in the Western world will tell you that we live in a socially constructed reality. Yeah, okay, that's true in a sense, but who do you think constructed it in that case? It's people like Confucius, or Buddha, 
or Plato or Dante or Shakespeare. These are our creators. That is, they're the reason we are like this, and not some other way. And you can actually become independent of them. You can breathe your own air, you can be a titan like that, but not if you remain unaware of what they've given you. If you're sort of a little bit afraid of what they, what they may actually be like. So, I advise you to sort of try to really look inside and outside like this, back and forth in the hermeneutic circle, because this is really a reaching beyond. It's a reaching beyond yourself and it's bursting chains. It's liberation. But in reading you don't do it by violence. You do it by understanding, really, truly, humbly understanding, by listening. And in the end, you know, there's, there's no difference between listening to the sounds of great men of the past and listening to the most noble parts of your own soul. And this, I can agree to call common humanity, but it's very uncommon, and the experience of it is divine rather than human anyway. So, so... This is basically the way I think of reading, and I'm going to tell you another model of reading that I picked up from somewhere else, and then I'm going to tell you where I got it from. So this is the way I think of reading. I think that every text that worth, that's worth reading has many, many levels of meaning. And when I say every text that's worth reading, you know, I mean basically the classics, you know, from every culture. Uh, I tend to think about every text that's truly revered, in any culture as something that's akin to holy scripture. It's a form of revelation. I just make that assumption about anything I read that's classic and old. And every layer of meaning that a text has, um, I think of it as related to a certain level of your own being. So that means that the more you've cultivated your understanding, the more capable you are of unlocking, as it were, the higher levels of meaning of a text. And the more you read, on a higher level like that also, uh, the more you are awakened to a higher dimension of perception in your mental world, which in itself enables a more powerful reading, and then it goes on and on like this. Uh, and then I, now I'm going to tell you where I got this description from. Perhaps you won't believe me. It's fairly obscure, and it's far from the field of Sinology. So there was this uh, Iranian mystic who lived in the 12th century, I think, and his name was Suravardi. Uh, I don't know if, well, the way well, how that's pronounced in Persian, but Surawardi anyway. And he was the founder of something called the Illuminationist School of Philosophy in Iran. And he believed in exactly this esoteric way of reading scripture with multiple levels of meaning and multiple levels of uh, refinement in your own soul, or divinity actually. And uh, he, his, this was an esoteric way of reading scripture, uh, which for him then meant obviously the Quran, because this was a Muslim religious context. And he said that the ever deeper meanings of the word of God are addressed to higher and higher parts of yourself. And he also named these parts of your soul after the seven prophets of Islam. So there was the Adam of your being, that's like level one, the Noah of your being, and so on and so forth. And then next, next to the top was the Jesus of your being, being the next to last prophet. And at the top then, the Mohammed of your being. That's the part of you that's able to grasp the innermost sense of the words of scripture. It's like you are Mohammed, a prophet of God, God himself almost, deep inside, really deep inside of you if you learn to read properly. And he also had a formulation which is also really a sort of concentration of the hermeneutic principle that I started with. He said, you must read the Quran as if it had been revealed just for you. You remember the way this started? You know, in the beginning I quoted another guy, apply all of yourself to the text and all of the text to yourself. It's the same thing. I mean, if the Quran uh, had been revealed by the Almighty just for you, well, that means that there's not a word of it uh, that doesn't concern you, right? It's up to you uh, to utilize all the intelligence that you have, all the experience that you have, uh, to realize what the message is for you as a person. So, so uh, true reading, it presupposes, uh, really, uh, the awakening and development of the person who reads. And in the final analysis, that is also the most noble goal of reading. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't stress enough how helpful uh, it is to have this perspective when you study a difficult text in classical Chinese. I mean, you know, 
If you proceed from the assumption that this text tells you something about you, it's strange. It's as if by magic you understand what to listen for it in it. Um, yeah. But uh, that's really all I have to say about reading. Uh, but there is, actually there is something more. There is, uh, there is something that goes even beyond this. Uh, I won't go into it too much, uh, because uh, it's so difficult to talk about. But the fact is that language is a form of thought, obviously. And thought has its roots in experience. Uh, thought is actually a form of experience, which is pretty obvious when you say it like that. But, you know, sometimes it's all... Somehow, you know, it's always treated as outside of experience. You have your experience here and your thoughts about it here. And the, the, next, the, the, the next level, sort of, beyond this is that everything that I've been saying now about texts and reading, I think it also applies to experience. Not just reading. Any experience. You know this old metaphor that uh, the universe is a book to be read? Well... Your experience is a book to be read. It's hard to raise yourself to that level of consciousness. I mean, I manage to do it occasionally, but I mean, suppose you are Surawardi and you believe that all of the Quran was addressed to you by the Almighty, except that, you know, all the world is your Quran. Every experience that you've ever had, the fullness of this living moment, imagine that that is a message from you. And it's only to you, and it comes from the deepest source of life, from God or whatever you might call it, whatever you want to call it. And this message, it calls you forth to acknowledge the fullness of the source of life and the fullness of the moment. And it also calls for you to be who you are. That's an extraordinary thought, isn't it? That's a life-changing thought, actually. And it may, may seem strange, but, you know, I propose that that is somewhere deep inside of you. That's the reason that you read. And that's the reason that you're watching this video, because it's a message to you that comes from somewhere that I don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it comes from. But just listen hard. And try this exercise. If you, ha if you have time, you can go back to the beginning of this video and listen to everything I've said again. But imagine that I'm talking about your own experience. Every time I mention reading, and you can see where that leads you. So good luck with that, and thank you for listening, and keep on reading.